Now, the rest of the story. It was as though the city streets had vanished, taking the lamplight with them, until the impenetrable gloom had engulfed all but Bill himself. Even his own hand before his eyes seemed strangely to be disappearing, as though some acid in the air were dissolving the whole world. A stranger in town, Bill was now utterly lost. Lost in the depths of an eerie night that fell in the middle of an August afternoon. For this was London, 1909. And the hungry thing that had swallowed the entire city, a monster the like of which Bill had never seen in the States, was the famous, ponderous, palpable London fog. For long moments, Bill stopped there, searching with his eyes through the nothingness and with his ears for some friendly sound that might guide him back to Earth. The distant clop-clopping of hoofs and the clatter of carriage wheels echoed assurance to the fact that life did endure somewhere out there, and yet the carriage lanterns as they passed, if indeed they were such at all, shone like elusive lighthouse beacons that might lead a sailor either to harbor or to a reef. And so, for what seemed a long time, Bill just stood frozen in his tracks, plotting in vain his advance or his retreat, waiting for some angel to find him in the fog and escort him safely to his destination. The angel came. And the angel came in a spirit through the gloom, first as a solitary glowing light growing brighter, a light that became a lantern, then a lantern with a hand affixed to it, and then the hand to which was attached a small child. Until at last there emerged through the blanket of gray a complete vision of Bill's rescuer, a 12-year young boy holding a lantern above his head and smiling. Are you quite all right, sir? The boy asked. And Bill confided that he was an American traveler unacquainted with London, that he was now very lost. The youngster asked Bill where he was going. Bill recited the address of his business appointment. Well, it's not far, the boy said. I'll take you there. And so he did. His lantern held high, bravely leading the visitor through the fog like a safari guide slashing a path through a wall of jungle green. Not only that, but when Bill was finished with his business, there outside the door was his young friend waiting to escort him back to his lodgings. When time had come for the two to part, Bill offered the youngster a gratuity. But the boy declined. No, sir, he said, I am a scout, and scouts do not accept tips for courtesies or good turns. And the boy walked away. And Bill never did catch his name. And yet that one good deed he did was at the same time a gift of immeasurable value to a nation that boy never knew. He is revered to this day as the unknown scout. For he was ambassador of a tiny fledgling organization in England who in the darkened streets of London one summer afternoon encountered a lost American. And that American was a Chicago publisher named William Dixon Boyce, who was so impressed by that experience, who was so inspired by the gracious generosity of that little lad that he... William Boyce returned to the United States to establish a tradition of utmost excellence and innumerable good deeds which the world knows as the Boy Scouts of America. Now you know the rest of the story. And now for the rest of the rest of the story. Bill was lucky to find a young boy who was willing to help him, a stranger, find his way in an unfamiliar city. Even more impressive is that the boy wanted nothing in return. Do you think this would happen in our modern society? Now that was over a century ago. Our world is much different than it was in 1910. In the first half of the 20th century, families were migrating from farms to cities for the promise of better opportunities. People who once farmed the land began taking factory jobs in cities. Their children had access to better educational opportunities, but many parents grew concerned that their children uh, were not learning self-reliance, individualism, even patriotism. Several groups were created to help with the development of young men, including the Woodcraft Indians, 
Sons of Daniel Boone and the YMCA. But none of them were as long-lasting as the Boy Scouts. Since the inception of the Boy Scouts of America, about 110 million Americans have participated. There are currently over 760,000 active members in the Scouts. On June 10, 1963, John F. Kennedy gave the commencement address at the American University in Washington, D.C. Here's an excerpt from that address. Our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Kennedy may have been speaking in favor of peace during the Cold War, but those words are just as meaningful today as they were in 1963. We all breathe the same air. That's a pretty impactful statement when you think about it. The Boy Scouts membership policies have been a source of controversy for decades, but it's not for me to try to change your beliefs or to persuade you to like or dislike the Boy Scouts. No matter what century we live in, we're all humans on the journey of life. Imagine what a wonderful world it would be if we showed a little more kindness, even to strangers, without the expectation of receiving something in return, just as that young boy did when he helped Bill find his way. The journey of life is not an easy one. Remember to be nice, be kind, be courteous. I'm Brad Dyson, and as Paul Harvey would say, good day.